be presenting in the packet D, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, did not know that was a thing until this conference. So, uh, light clients. Ethereum 2 light clients. How light is light? Um, they're really integral to Ethereum 2. We're going to see why they're integral, what a light client is, um, and I'm going to try to give you some of like the thinking behind how a light client works and how to think about the light client universe. Uh, so, brief introduction about me. Uh, I'm a Ethereum 2 developer at Chainsafe Systems. I have a Twitter and I have a GitHub. You might have interacted with me online, and these are my profile pics right now. Uh, working on a project called Lodestar. Uh, we're building a TypeScript Ethereum 2 ecosystem. Started with the Beacon Chain. Um, we're also building on a light client, and we're um, going to be involved with uh, helping with the developer tooling as well. So uh, trying to onboard Ethereum 1 developers into the Ethereum 2 ecosystem. Uh, we chat on Discord, so if anyone wants to talk to us, we're available there, and also Twitter and all the other relevant places. Uh, and Chainsafe, uh, this is where I work. It's a great group of guys and gals. Uh, everyone's based out of Toronto, mostly. Uh, and we all work on like protocol level blockchain development. Um, they, they are all online, so hit them up, they're really, really great people. So, uh, this is what we're gonna be covering. Um, we're gonna start off uh, with just what a light client is, why we need light clients, why we need them in Ethereum 2, get like a sense of what that even, like. What is a, like? What is a, what is a full node? What is a what is a light client? Like what is a light node? It, it it's uh it's not it's it's probably pretty obvious. Uh, but in Ethereum one we haven't really been using them. We we use Infira. We use MetaMask. It uses Infira. We use EtherScan. We're not really used to interacting with light clients, and um, there's been a lot of research into making it more usable, making it more like a, a default experience, but. Um, we're going to need to kind of start there with Ethereum 2 because of some reasons that I'll get into. Um, we'll go into some background about that you'll need, that we'll kind of want to cover before we get into kind of the meat of things, which is the actual light client and how we are going to be syncing data. So, just some motivation. Uh, what is a light client? A light client is software looking to securely consume blockchain data um, and it has requirements that scale logarithmically to the total blockchain state. So logarithmically, um, you kind of think of like this kind of curve um, as like the blockchain grows and grows and grows. The amount of data that you need to actually process as a light client, you want that to not really change very much at all. Um, one way to think of it is like as like the total size uh, grows exponentially, then the total size that you need to verify things only doubles. So if, let's say the, the chain went from a thousand transactions a day to a million transactions a day, that would only require like a doubling of uh, where a light client would need to process. So why do we need light clients in Ethereum 2? They're, they're going to be first class citizens, I, I think, uh, in like the new uh, version of Ethereum. So we think about some certain cases where we're going to need them. Uh, resource constrained environment. So I'm sure everyone here has uh, a smartphone on them, but who here has the, Ethereum, has the chain synced on their phone? <laughs> no one? Okay. Uh, I mean, it's probably, a lot of you have MetaMask on your phone, but uh, MetaMask is <laughs> ever, all using Infira, and Infira is a great service. Not, not trying to diss it, but um, you're kind of losing out on some of the uh, guarantees that you get with a blockchain when you're relying entirely on Infira. Uh, one really interesting case for light clients, uh, especially in like this very burgeoning ecosystem of blockchains, is to be able to have uh, other blockchains as light clients to your blockchain. So 
um, when we launched Ethereum 2. It would be really cool if the Ethereum 1 blockchain was able to, in some way, validate the data of Ethereum 2. You can think of that as like a light client into Ethereum 2. And so, if we make things easy enough, if we make things like small enough, it, it becomes more practical to do that in more places. Another thing to consider is, in Ethereum 1, it's really easy for everyone to get the whole state of the world. In Ethereum 2, we are moving to the sharded architecture where it's not actually going to be feasible for everyone to store all the data, like even if you wanted to, like unless maybe you just ran out a bunch of servers on AWS. Like for pra practically speaking, most people aren't going to st store everything. And even like, uh, even within just the protocol itself, like validators are going to be required to be syncing shards at different points. Uh, they're going to be required to be uh, uh, proposing new blocks for different shards. So they're going to have to sync up at that point. They're going to have to be uh, attesting to different parts of the recent shard state through crosslinks. And so during these cases, they're going to need to be uh, like quickly downloading parts of, of shards that they don't have, and so they're going to need to do that in a way that, like, that they can verify. And so, you know, they're not going to be using an inferior like system to be doing that. They're going to need to actually, like, have proof that what they're getting is legitimate. So with that said, let's just cover some things that um, some of you probably know, but I just want to cover because uh, it'll really help out, like just the thinking and like understanding of watch, of uh, of life science. So Merkle proofs are basically the key to the castle for uh, for life science. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know this. A lot of a lot of you might know this, but uh, we'll kind of cover it real briefly. Uh, so Merkle proofs are a way to verify some piece of data of data uh, within a larger uh, suite of data where you only need to verify a logarithmic amount of data to, to get to, uh, to, 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 uh, to validate that, that something is authentic. So, well, usually what we, when we like, are wanting some kind of data, we're assuming it's part of a Merkle tree. And um, a Merkle tree is just a hash of successive hashes of successive hashes, and you end up with this kind of root hash, which is uh, uh, kind of ha says something about all of the data underneath of it. Um, and s very importantly, when we're kind of thinking about Merkle proofs, um, we have this root that we trust. And so this scheme of like verifying data only works when we have this root that we trust. Um, so these, the, the roots are often like what's stored in a blockchain. Uh, so actually when you're verifying, this Merkle proof, usually the only thing you know is the root. And everything else is kind of just unknown to you. And that, that's why you're re requesting a proof in the first place. You're trying to get some information that you don't already have. Um, so when we're given a chunk of data, we have to, what we're doing with the proof is we're linking it from this bottom piece all the way up to this root that we already know. And so we're, we're wanting to be able to recreate this root, which we do trust. So what we, what we need with a, a proof, and what the proof actually is, is it's one intermediate node per level in the tree, starting from the bottom. So we're able to kind of build up to the very top of the, of the tree, to the root. And at that point, you can compare this recreated root against your previously computed or previously trusted root. And if they match, then you kind of like have proven this entire chain all the way to the bottom. And so what's really cool about this is that you only need one node per level of the tree. And that grows very, very slowly with like the total amount of data. Uh, so that's why it's so important for, for these light clients because it's only a small amount of, of, of work that you need to do to prove, even if there's a giant amount of data in the block. Uh, kind of a side tangent, multi-proofs. That's uh, kind of just an extension of the Merkle proof idea. And a Merkle multi-proof, we are proving data about multiple pieces in this tree, or multiple leaves in the tree. 
Uh, and so, very similar to a Merkle proof, you're wanting to build back up the tree to the root. But what makes a molten proof a little bit different is that you can kind of you can share these intermediate nodes between uh, uh, between all of your paths, and so you're able to be it's able to be a little bit more efficient um, than just having one proof for one branch, one proof for another branch. Um, we're, we're gonna we end up taking advantage of this for uh, Ethereum two like plants. Uh, another thing to think, to think about is the difference between proof of work and proof of stake like clients. So, in proof of work like clients, it's really uh, it's kind of easy because everything is everything that you need is within the protocol. You can download all the headers and you verify everything based on protocol rules. So, uh, these this is kind of like the headers. You download all the headers. You. If everything is available to you just from those headers. You hash the headers, you verify the proof of work, you verify that the header points back to the previous header, and then that's, that, that's all you need to do. And then once, once you're at like the final header, the Merkle roots are right there, and then you can request the proofs. So the steps usually go sync up, and now you have, now you have then you can just request proofs. In proof of stake, it's a little bit different because the headers alone aren't sufficient to verify proofs. You have to also keep track of the stake of validators because in, in this proof of stake world, we're governed by some super majority stake. So we have to ensure we're on the chain with the most stake. And the only way you can do that is by keeping track of the validators and their balances and how they voted. So this is it's it's a it's a different beast than proof of work, but it's an opportunity to do things a little bit differently and maybe do things a little more efficiently. Um, I want to take another little detour uh, to something called simple serialize, which is a spec that we have for Ethereum two, and it's a way to consistently and easily uh, Merkleize our <coughs> data structures. So to kind of kind of go through, do it by example. Um, so what we, what it does is, uh, is we can we create a consistent way of creating these Merkle roots for any kind of data structure that we have. So for example, we have a checkpoint. A checkpoint is an epoch and a root. So if we wanted to make a Merkle tree out of this, we would uh, just put each of these elements into chunks and then create uh, a hash from those. We can get a little more complicated, um, if we have a thing called a crosslink, uh, then we can still create uh, a Merkle tree from that. We just pad it with some, some zero data. And then we can kind of put them even, they can kind of compose these data structures. So here's another example of an attestation data which uses a checkpoint and uses a crosslink. And so you can, um, because things are, are, are Kind of built out systematically, it makes it very easy to, if you want to think about the, the proofs that we kind of went over earlier, it makes it very easy to be able to traverse the tree and create a proof for uh, any sub-element of a data structure. And things get, things can get really, these, these structures can get really, really nested in the Ethereum 2 world. So um, we, you know, we have, we, we put Merkle roots within a lot of these data structures. We can link beacon blocks to our beacon state. We can link our beacon state to beacon blocks, trust certain trusted beacon blocks. Uh, we can link our shard blocks to beacon blocks. And so um, you can imagine like, say like the data root within uh, this crosslink here. That data root is actually a Merkle root of some other data, which you can then, you can imagine there being a tree below that. Um, and then so you can, en you can end up navigating down this tree uh, like further and further even into the past or into a shard or um, back into the beacon chain. So we've like designed this in a way where it's we try to make it as friendly as possible to be able to create these proofs that can take you where you need to go, where wherever you need to go is some place in, in the in the chain. So with that we can kind of we can start finally finally get to the these two light client itself. So let's start with uh, syncing. So 
and we, we kind of look, looked at the proof of work model of syncing, which is download all the headers and then process headers one by one. Um, so what we need to do here is we need to think, how can we get these trusted Merkle roots in our proof of stake system? Um, and can we do this synchly? So smaller, you know, smaller amount of data, fewer steps, that's better um, for our lifeline needs. Um, but what is trusted? Well, trusted is our roots that are attested by a certain amount of stake, two thirds roughly. I mean, if, um, but the stakes, the staked votes give weight <coughs> to the chain. So we need to make sure that the roots that we're getting are roots that mean something. So um, we can kind of think of two key insights that that kind of change how we can pro progress in, in syncing. So one is, instead of syncing headers by, hash, by hashing one, one by one and progressing just one at a time, we can use stake to vote, we can use the stake uh, uh, to skip ahead to a current trusted header without having to verify every single header one by one. Just instead, instead of using kind of the cryptographic uh, uh, trust of each header being, of each previous header being included in the next header, we can instead, if we, if we already know who's validating, we can use the trust, uh, we, can, we can use, uh, if, if we count all the votes, we can jump ahead to uh, a place much further in the, in, where we don't have to go one by one. So if you imagine like a blockchain where uh, the validators never changed, and the balances never changed. We had, we knew everything. We could we would be able to skip immediately to the to the very head of the chain um, if if we saw that everyone was voting for that head. The the the, the kind of the, the, the trick with uh, Ethereum two is that the validators are always changing, and so we need to keep be keeping track of that, and that makes it a little more complicated. So that brings us to another key insight, which is. Instead of tracking all of the validator balances and all of the votes, if we can find a place where we don't have to do that, if we can find a place where we only need to track a few of the validators, um, then that will really like lower our requirements for uh, for keeping track of the, the stake. So where where do these two validators validate? Um, well, um, they validate in cross link committees. Um, this is one place. It's very fast. They, these, these committees change every epoch. Um, and they, uh, so they attest to recent shard data. They attest to the beacon block route, which is great, but that they actually, we have to count all the votes across committees in, order, in that case, so that isn't helping. Uh, and they attest to recent checkpoints also, as the whole validator said. So the, val the cross committees aren't really a great place uh, to like keep track for light clients because we we really need the whole validator set um, and so they're not helping us out. So the other place that we can look uh, is in the shard committees and so these are the committees that are proposing new blocks within shards at least in the, the current scheme um, and these only change every 27 hours so this is actually a lot better of a place for light clients because if we're wanting to keep track of the votes we're trying to keep track of the <coughs> validators. Those, these things only really update very infrequently. And so, because they update more infrequently, that's less work that we need to do as a, as a life plan. Uh, so that brings us to the sync protocol. So, um, what, what we end up doing is uh, we try, to, we, we sync to a certain shard Oh, well, my time is up. <laughs> but uh, I, have, I, I tweeted out my slides, um, and they kind of cover the rest of all of this if you want. Um, it's on HackMD, and I'll put it in the HackMD for this uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank you